We're joined today with Dr. Sarah Lane Ritchie. How are you today, Sarah? I'm doing splendidly. How are you guys? Doing really well. So just to start off, can you tell us a little bit about your background and the research that you've done over the years? Sure. So I guess it depends on what sort of background you'd like. Uh, but my academic background is uh, sort of unusual in the philosophy, theology, science space. Um, I started off in philosophy and religion as an undergrad, but was really kind of focused on uh, biology and psychology. Um, in my, uh, I studied a master divinity at Princeton Seminary. We started really getting into science and religion when I was there. And then went hardcore into science and religion as its own discipline in uh, Scotland and Edinburgh is where I did my PhD and my postdoc in St. Andrews. Um, and my research has mostly focused on the intersection of philosophy, theology, and the mind-related sciences. Uh, so spanning topics from like, why do people believe in God or not believe in God? So a lot of cognitive science of religion uh, to uh, kind of all the way to what I do now, which is more spiritual technology stuff. So how much agency do we have and what we experience to be true about the world? Uh, can you uh, become an active participant in your belief formation or your worldview formation or your meaning making processes? And uh, looking at a lot of like the empirical literature around particular spiritual technologies that people are using both within and outside of religion. Awesome. And how did you transition from that to today's topic of psychedelics? Mm -hmm. So it's so the way that I conceptualize it, it's not uh, a transition at all. Uh, I think of uh, psychedelics when appropriately used and contextualized as being a spiritual technology. So um, it's kind of interesting, actually. I came to the topic of psychedelics as a research uh, kind of program um, through my work on uh, the problem of divine hiddenness. So why do some people not believe in, not experience that God is real, not seem to have access to knowledge of God uh, in any sort of meaningful way, um, and which is a, sort of a classic problem in philosophy of religion and theology. Uh, and so it's kind of like through work on that and then getting more into psychology of religion and cognitive science of religion um, that I started exploring the various avenues around, uh, the various avenues that people have um, pursued uh, as sort of a, um, a way of addressing the problem of divine hiddenness. Uh, and, some people chose meditation, some people choose liturgical practice, some people have had transformative encounters on psychedelics. So uh, that's kind of uh, how I ended up in, uh, in, that, in that space. Great. So there seems to be a lot of attention put on psychedelics lately. You see it on Joe Rogan, especially, and I've seen quite a few documentaries on this. It seems to be blowing up, even in the academic realm, as your recent paper shows. Why do you think that is? Uh, so certainly, I think it's being driven by the resurgence in uh, scientific research uh, in this area. So for decades, after kind of the, the, the scare and the political crackdown on psychedelics research uh, back in the mid 20th century, um, pretty much nobody was do, able to do research on psychedelics. And in the last couple of decades, um, for various reasons, um, the research scene has opened up again. Like re universities have been able to get funding for psychedelics research. Um, also some leading thought leaders, some like uh, very uh, compelling public figures have become more open like about their psychedelic experiences. So like Tim Ferriss is an example of this. Um, so sort of like on the social and like thought leader front, and then also on the scientific research front, uh, people have become activated uh, by a real curiosity to know, to know more about the science uh, and mental health benefits of psychedelics. So in your paper that you, you write on this, you focus on panpsychism and human flourishing. Could you maybe give us a sense of what you mean by those terms and, and how that relates to this discussion? Sure. And so I think the paper you're referring to is this, yeah, a paper I did on uh, panpsychi panpsychism, psychedelics and flourishing. I've also uh, spoken and written uh, in other contexts, just dropping the panpsychism part. But in that paper in particular, um, I explore 
metaphysical frameworks that would support a what I call a veridical interpretation of psychedelics. So what that means is that um, there's a reason for there are some metaphysical possibilities and frameworks that um, would give one warrant to take uh, psychedelic experiences seriously in an epistemological way. So we might be able to learn something from these experiences based on one's philosophy of mind and one's kind of cosmology. Um, and pa- and panpsychism, I mean, basically there are like hundreds of different perspectives about like how one should define panpsychism, but it's basically the idea that, um, that reality is mind all the way down. So there's nothing that's not mental in some way. And there's a lot of um, sort of just sort of trying to distinguish between what, like different sorts of mentality and something being fully conscious versus like proto conscious and tons of debates about that. But the basic idea is that all the material world is in some way um, bound up in what we would call consciousness, like the, the, that mind is just fundamental to reality. And there's actually quite a lot in the Christian tradition to support that view theologically. Um, and it's a view that gets away from dualisms of all forms. Uh, so it's appealing for a lot of reasons. Um, and then the other part you asked about was spiritual flourishing. Spiritual flourishing, I uh, think about in a very holistic way. Uh, I think about uh, connectedness to um, God or ultimate reality, uh, others, the world, oneself. I think about transcendence um, and meaning making. Uh, so there are a variety of things that would fall under spiritual flourishing. Uh, but I tend to approach it in a very embodied way, uh, in a way that recognizes the uh, sort of centrality of the body and the material world and our meaning making processes and in our, um, our, our basically our cognition and how we form beliefs about the world and concepts about the world. Go ahead, John. Well, let's just drive into it, dive right into it. What is a psychedelic experience like? I mean, your, your average, typical psychedelic experience, what are you going to go through? Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's, I wouldn't say there's one type of psychedelic experience. It's probably, you know, if I said that there was a sort of archetypal psychedelic experience, I would get 500 angry, angry emails saying that I was wrong. Uh, and there's not young Ian archetypes people. here. <laughs> yeah. People and people would be right in their criticisms. Um, so, um, it depends. So, so a lot of this just depends on the mechanics of things, right? So what substance are you taking? What is the dosage? Um, what is the context? So are you in a therapeutic clinical context? Are you at like a rave with friends? Like those are things are going to drastically impact, uh, what sort of experience you have, but let's say that you're having kind of the, um, the sort of experience that is most often studied uh, by researchers today, which is a sort of like a clinical setting. So you have like spiritual kind of music or nature music or something kind of mellow uh, going on. You probably have some like a blindfold on or this dark in the room. You're probably like laying on a couch or something. You've done a lot of prep work and are kind of preparing yourself to have some sort of important transformative experience or journey, you'll probably have some sort of um, pressing uh, questions. So like there, there's usually when people intentionally have psychedelic, psychedelic experiences, they're trying to um, address a challenge or a kind of a pain point in their life. So a lot of the research is on uh, addiction or depression, anxiety, PTSD. And so people with those conditions will uh, kind of bring that focus to the experience. Um, and then others might be kind of seeking a more like a meaning making experience that's not connected to a mental health condition. And they might have a question about meaning in life or connectedness with loved ones or something like that. Um, so when you have kind of a serious intention like that, it, um, the trips will often, uh, again, they're extremely varied, but oftentimes you'll, uh, there will be kind of a period of the trip that is, um, quite disorienting. So there's a real period of, uh, letting go for a lot of people in the beginning of an experience as you're like what they say, coming up on, on the trip. And, um, the most important thing that clinicians will always tell patients is that you have to, you, re- you really need to do is trust, let go and be open. So trust, let go, be open. And a lot of people really struggle in the first parts of these experiences 
to really trust, let go and be open. They resist, they fight. Um, and sort of like another idea in these trips is that you'll probably see things like you'll see a door or a tunnel or like there's going to be some sort of imagery happening. And the idea is that you want to lean into the experience. So if there's a stairway, you want to walk up the stairway in the experience. If there's a door, you want to open it. The idea is to sort of say yes to the experience, trust that everything will be okay and kind of confront whatever you need to confront. And then a lot of people will have some sort of, well, depending on the strength of the uh, experience, um, of the dose, um, a lot of people will have some real, a real battle, like a real struggle of some form. It can be against oneself, against some sort of dark something that you've been fighting. And you'll feel, it can feel very unpleasant. So a lot of people will say after a trip, hey, this is like the most important thing that's ever happened to me. Also, I never want to do it again. Uh, that's a very common thing for people to say, changed my life, don't want to do it again. Um, and that's part of the reason actually that psychedelics are like anti-addictive because they are generally really not pleasant. Um, and so there's a lot of hard stuff that will happen usually in the first part of the experience. And then oftentimes there's some sort of like hero's journey where there's like a resolution. So like when at this kind of the peak of the experience, a lot of people will be confronted with some sort of uh, divine or ultimate love. Words always fail for people. They can never explain what they're, what's happening to them. Usually they'll start to say, they'll, they'll come back with something like, oh my God, love is the most important thing ever. And everyone else is like, yeah, no kidding. But it's like they get a more profound experience of it and it's hard to put it into words, but like, they'll get some sort of deeply profound realization of divine love or um, just sort of the love is like the fundamental nature of all reality or something like that. Um, or they'll get a very clear insight about how uh, their lives need to change going forward. Uh, that's very common. And they'll see their own bodies, their, their selves in a different way. So people who smoke will often get this sense, they'll have, they'll have like a visual experience in the, um, uh, in the trip of like the pollutants that the cigarettes are like putting into their body or something. And we'll walk away from the experience and never want to touch them again. So it's like, so you get kind of a, a very multifaceted experience of uh, normal reality too. So sort of everything that you think of as normal and kind of like mundane takes on like a very vivid and salient hue. Um, and then there's like a long come down phase where your body, your mind is just really processing the whole experience. And that takes certainly hours, but can really take days as well because of how, um, because of what the substances do to your brain, really. Like you have much more, um, your, your brain is much more plastic for a couple of days after these experiences. So all of that sounds quite nice, honestly, like an experience of divine love and meaning and finding a new purpose in life. And yet you say that people never want to have this experience again. Mm -hmm. Is there mm -hmm. typically a reason for that? Well, a lot of the normal structural features of our lives are taken away in psychedelic experiences. So time, <laughs> is very weird on a, in a psychedelic experience. And so like in a normal, like in your day-to-day -day life, you're in a bad, you're having a crisis. You know the crisis will end because there's only 24 hours in a day and you can't exist in that space forever. Uh, on psychedelics, if you're going through a challenging part of the experience, it feels like you are in that experience for eternity, like, like all of eternity. And so <laughs> it's like, you don't have any, it feels like, like time is gone and you can experience an actual eternity of uh, disconnectedness or loss of self or complete disconnection from the universe. And it's kind of like a hell, like pretty much, I mean, some of the worst trips I've heard are kind of like what traditional Christianity has described hell as being like. Um, and um, people usually come through that, like if they really like sink into the experience, they come off the other side of it and uh, have something that's transformative uh, and insights that will come out of it. Um, but that doesn't mean that they would want to go through the eternity of disconnectedness and aloneness to get to that insight again. So it's sort of like any hard thing we do in life, you, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, we might not want to go through it again, but um, we can recognize it as valuable, like childbirth or something. For the most part, do people tend to come out the other side with that positive spin? and the cases where it was just an overall negative experience without any 
thing good coming out of it or any lesson are those rare cases where people have just a horrible experience that wasn't worth it at all uh or, or is is it a bit more of a mixed bag and some people don't just not enjoy it but but think it was not worth it it was a horrible thing without a, a benefit what, what's the ratio of good to to bad in that yeah there's, there's some meta reviews of the clinical work on this um so the unfortunately it's impossible to answer your question because most of the experiences that have occurred throughout human history are not being done by clinicians who are writing them up in peer-reviewed journals um, and they're not done in controlled settings and so um i have i, I can't um i can't accurately identify the percentage of people who are having bad trips uh, and are not happy that they did it uh, I can say that in the clinical setting, that, which is the site of the um, where all the research is happening, where things are very controlled, very intentional. There's a lot of prep work. There's a lot of post-experience work, a lot of therapy that goes on. Um, in those controlled settings, uh, it's far more likely that people will have an important life-changing experience than a negative worthless experience. But they put the work in. Now I can see somebody who hearing this and saying, okay, this is all great. It has some positive effects, but it's all just a hallucination of the mind generated by the mind. There's nothing really veridical in that, but mm -hmm. it, you seem to want to suggest that there's actually is some reasons for thinking that this does convey something true about reality. What are some of those reasons? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't say I want to say that I would say that I like playing around with the possibilities here. Um, so when I first started getting interested in the psychedelic research space, I was really struck by how few philosophers and theologians were engaging the material. And that's why I started getting into it. Cause I'm like, nobody else is, is taking this seriously. Nobody is dealing with this huge area of research that is like very powerful and potent and is like changing people's lives. And somebody needs to be engaging with the epistemology of this, the ethics of it, sort of the theology of it, if there is any. Um, so I would want to problematize the first thing that you said. I'm actually not sure that these days pe many people or most people would say that psychedelic experiences are hallucination. So certainly clinically, that's not the case because hallucinations are sort of like um, they're time limited. They're usually tied to a, an identifiable, diagnosable like mental disorder. Um, they are uh, things that are not tied to flourishing or well-being in any way. No positive outcomes tend to come from, from hallucinations and they don't have an enduring effect. So psychiatrists will want to distinguish between hallucination, which is like very time limited in effect, um, is tied to uh, a, a disorder that has um, very bad um, effects in other areas of people's lives um, and tends to just basically not help the person in any way. Psychedelic experiences are different uh, because they're actually fairly predictable. I mean, they're, they're kind of predictable in clinical settings. Like the contours of an experience are often kind of um, uh, again, we're, we're, we're often not surprised by the contours of an experience because it kind of follows like a similar pattern or arc. Um, also there are really long lasting mental health and transformative kind of meaning making effects of psychedelic experiences in like positive ways. Like 20 years later, people will look back on a psychedelic experience and say, that was one of the most, the top five, it was in the top five most meaningful experiences of my life. Like up there with death, like death of a child or birth of a child, loss of a parent, that kind of thing. Um, so long lasting positive effects, um, changing kind of behavioral health outcomes, like people like get off addictions and are, um, they really kind of are kind of experientially equipped to face challenges in a different way. And so none of those things apply to uh, hallucinations. So certainly something is happening in psychological experiences that's not happening in mental health uh, disorders where hallucinations are a feature. So that's why it's interesting. That's why philosophers are starting to get more interested in like what the epistemic status of these experiences are. So there are a couple camps here. So one route is to take sort of the um, sort of the uh, the uh, the Chris Lethaby route. He is a, a philosopher uh, who has written a book, a fantastic book called Philosophy of Psychedelics. And he's, uh, I would say, the most serious uh, analytic philosopher uh, who is trying to deal with the epistemology of psychedelic. And he wants to say, you know, it's a naturalistic world out there. I'm not signing up to theism. I'm not signing up to trans. I'm not signing up to any sort of the weird kooky worldviews 
He's like, I'm a good old naturalist. And I still think that psychedelics are epistemologically valuable. And the way that he uh, will describe it is, there be, is, is that psychedelics give people a different sort of firsthand knowledge of things that they kind of knew before, but didn't really know. So it's a sort of, um, it's a sort of, uh, uh, the, his idea is that psychedelics give one access to knowledge that one would have already said in most cases that they agreed with. But in retrospect, we can see that we didn't actually know it. It's sort of like, um, you might say, yeah, yeah, I believe so-and-so loves me. But if you don't actually really, truly believe it as real or as true, then you're not going to respond in, 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 in a way that suggests that you do. And so it's this idea that you could, you know, you might think that you believe something, but you don't actually know it at the level at which one needs to know it for that concept or truth to become operative in your life. Uh, and then the other tack is to do what I kind of am interested in and say, well, okay, yeah, it might be useful as sort of like, you know, just sort of like getting through my life. It might be helpful for me. Like it might be epistemologically useful for me uh, in, in, in getting the tools to, to live my life. But I'm actually interested in um, how these experiences that are so powerful might uh, connect to other ways of thinking about the world, other models of God, other worldviews um, that would help make sense of the whole picture. And uh, because certainly psychedelics are not a new thing for all of human history, as far as we can tell, people have been having mystical experiences, whether occasioned by psychedelic substances or other behaviors that we do with our bodies, like meditation and dancing and trances and fasting. And all these things are spiritual technologies that people have used to manipulate and alter their perceptions and experiences of the world. So um, I'm, I like, I'm, I'm, very curious about worldviews that uh, try to integrate it all. Uh, so panpsychism is one. I, I'm interested in panentheism as, as well. Um, and even, even within kind of traditional, classical, philosophical Western theism, there are resources to support uh, the use of psychedelics and um, in, in kind of becoming an active participant in your own spiritual path. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of like, I'm personally interested in models that attempt to integrate scientific, philosophical, and theological knowledge into one. So just as a clarification, the hallucination idea is that to distinguish between a psychedelic experience and a hallucination, hallucination has certain features that are normally negative, they don't have any sort of positive role in their life, that psychedelics really don't fit the bill for. There's something completely different and that, mm -hmm. that the type of experience is completely different. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's what's motivated these philosophers to begin to start taking this so seriously. Mm -hmm. Well, I find that interesting. Yeah, Can I... Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it was really the, psych I was gonna it was really the psychologist and the psychiatrist who kind of picked up on this first. I mean, because these are people who are used to working with people having hallucinations, and what they saw with um, what they saw with with psychedelics was that something very different was happening. You know, there was a pattern of people having transformative experiences on these substances that then like changed their lives in really positive ways. And so they started. I mean, really, the scientists were the first ones to be like, "We got to figure out what's going on here." Um, and so now there are all sorts of, you know, like neuroscientific models for like what actually is happening. This is, it's a hot area of research, like what actually is happening in the brain to sort of give people these experiences and there are different models for it, but they're certainly distinct than what's happening in a hallucination. Yeah. And let's dive right into it. You said panpsychism, panentheism. If we can get really speculative here what could these experiences teach us about God, teach us about reality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm really drawn to uh, models of the world, models of reality that are, um, I don't want to say simple, but sort of simple, right? So I think there is something to this idea that um, there have been mystics and sages and uh, people in pretty much all the world face. Uh, I'm not saying that all religions are the same. I would never say that. But I think there there are some sort of similar themes throughout the world, the world's uh, major traditions uh, that would support that there are some things that we want to be able to say about ultimate reality if we can say anything at all. So like, I quite like the idea of saying that a fun, like fundamental ultimate reality is loving, whatever that means. We can argue about that, but is in some way love. 
that uh, flourishing for all living creatures is a good thing. Like, you know, I think there's some basic, that kindness and mercy are in some way uh, values that we should pursue. Like there are some sort of uncontroversial um, ways of wanting to see the world that the that religions have really kind of made a mark, made a business of, 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 uh, of really getting into hard. Um, but you also see those themes, all three of those themes popping up again and again and again in psychedelic experiences. Um, and so I think it's really fun to play around with this idea that when people have any sort of mystical or spiritual experience, um, there is, it is at least possible, perhaps plausible that given the work that they put into those experiences, given their priors, given what they're bringing to the experiences, um, that is at least possible that they are in fact having some deeply meaningful experience of something worth calling ultimate reality, perhaps worth calling God especially in these experiences where people have um, like life-changing encounters with divine love. I find those ones to be the most compelling because they're, they're actually quite frequent. A lot of people have this experience of divine love. They wouldn't often say it's God that they're experiencing. A lot of people feel like God is too small a word to describe what they're experiencing, but they would want to say something like fundamental reality is love. Um, and wouldn't it be great if we had a worldview that could support taking that experience seriously, not just saying it's like a byproduct of wishful thinking and the drug combined, but saying something like, yeah, because our minds are connected with kind of universal mind or fundamental consciousness, whatever, um, on the panpsychism model or in the panentheism model, all that exists exists within God in the first place. So like, everything that is minds bodies natural world all of it uh is infused with god in some meaningful way so on either of those models uh you could support the claim that uh yeah i'm having a psychedelic experience and um i am warranted in saying that that was an experience of god it's interesting because you've made a very strong case here for this religious connection and and to me, it, it makes sense to some degree. This is what churches and youth pastors are trying to create in worship services with the kids having their hands up. They're trying to create that experience of divine love and intimacy and forgiveness. And I'm wondering, do you think there's a reason Western, the Western religious and particularly Christianity is so against drugs when I could imagine a reality in which, uh, not drugs, but psychedelics, I could imagine a reality in which these could have been deeply linked and this could have been one of the greatest tools of, of Christianity and the church in a Western context. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I've written a lot about this actually sort of the connection between the sorts of spiritual technology that I explore and what uh, American evangelicalism has been doing for quite a long time now. Um, one of the so sure of course one of the first things that people always say anytime you're having a, a, a discussion about psychedelics is you're just manipulating yourself you are manipulating yourself and actually they'll say that about any spiritual technology like if i'm talking about uh pretty much every talk i've given where i'm like talking about um scientifically based ways of enhancing the possibility or uh sort of making more likely the possibility that you will experience god as real uh Every time I talk about this, people will always ask, aren't you just manipulating yourself? And my response to this is always, what do you think you're doing when you go into an evangelical megachurch and there's a fog machine playing and the lights are dimmed and everybody is swaying back and forth in rhythm and there is a uh, very attractive youth pastor up on stage playing a four chord song on his guitar and you're singing the same phrases over and over and over again and those are very emotionally charged almost romantic phrases that are like t pushing all of your deep triggers and wounds inside of you <laughs> like what do you think you're doing do you not think that this experience has been finely orchestrated to make you experience something very powerful like this is something that humans have been doing for all of human. Well, we've been doing this for all of human history. We are constantly, constantly inviting others to manipulate ourselves. And I don't think it's bad. I mean, we use the word manipulation as though it's like a, it's a pejorative word, right? But really we're saying, you know what? We have no, we have no option, but to be altered by the world, altered by our own minds and by others' minds and bodies. Um, and we curate experiences for ourselves. We go to totally emotionally charged sports games. We go to concerts that make us weep. We 
go on like romantic dates with partners and cultivate an intimacy with them. We uh, go to movies because we want them to make us laugh or to feel something. We read novels that will like help us lose ourselves for a moment. These are all things that we're doing to uh, to manipulate our experience in some way. And we tend to have some language for why that's not bad. Um, and uh, so I would say that certainly something like psychedelics is riskier than many of those other things, but it's not different in kind than what we have been doing for all of human history. And certainly not all that different from what um, American churches in particular have gotten very good at doing and curating worship services to capture all of a human. So their body, their mind, their emotions to capture some, to capture all parts of them. If you're interested in this, I highly recommend reading Tanya Lerman's When God Talks Back. She's an anthropologist at Stanford who has uh, done a ton of field work at Hillsong churches studying exactly this stuff. You know, I think one of the, uh, just as a bit anecdotal thing, I think one of the most powerful spiritual experiences I ever had was one time whenever I was stuck out on a dock having to hold a boat that it was in, and there was a sunset, and it was a beautiful sunset, and I got to watch it, and I had to sit there and watch it for an hour while someone went and got the trailer. For an hour, I couldn't pull out my phone because I had to hold this thing and watch a beautiful <laughs> sunset, and I did. I had a sense of like a mystical experience of like an ego death, a sort of collapse, and it, it was one of the most frightening experiences of my life. It, it lasted for a good half second. And before I sort of pulled myself out of it, um, come to find out that a lot of Christian mystics did the exact same thing where they would yeah. stare at a candle. And I, would, I had no idea that I was essentially accidentally replicating this old mystical really? experience in my own life. Yeah, it was, I found that out because I was so perplexed by this experience that I spent like a year trying to figure it out and finally came to this conclusion. Oh, see, um, I was really hoping the end of the story was you got really, really high on psychedelics, Seth. But okay, <laughs> that's it took a turn in a different direction. <laughs> not quite, not but quite I, that what exciting. What I love about that story is that you stumbled into it. And this is basically the story of human evolution, how we have done this like trial and error thing for all of human history and have stumbled across things that work, right? That help us that enable us to feel this uh, sense of transcendence or connectedness to one another, to God. Sometimes those things are not pleasant, a little bit of ego death involved. So it's fascinating, actually, that you stumbled into it and then realized, mm -hmm. that, oh, others have not only stumbled into this in the past, but have then turned it into a spiritual discipline. Focus attention, excluding other um, sort of uh, uh, claims on our, our senses uh, and, and have turned it into like um, a path, like a discipline. Uh, and... Uh, but probably stumbled into it in the first instance. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's one of those things that I'm still, I mean, if you look at my bookshelf, you can't even see it. I have all these books on Christian mysticism now, which I never would have thought three or four years ago that I ever would have bought, but it was, it was a really powerful experience about a half second long that was mm -hmm. quite transformative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sunsets yeah. are a gateway drug to. Uh... <laughs> so I, I have to ask though, I remember in your talk that you gave on Star Island, you mentioned some peculiar things that go on in the brain, because I can still see a skeptic saying, well, what happens in the brain is the brain is just generating these experiences, these doorways, these feelings mm -hmm. of love. But you get, seem to suggest that the brain science, the neuroscience doesn't really seem to suggest that it might suggest something else. Can you talk a little bit about that? I don't remember what I said two years ago on Star Island, but I can certainly say that, um, I mean, all of our experiences are generated by the brain. Like it's like, there's, we don't have a single experience that's not at least being mediated by our brains. Um, and so psychedelics are really no different. Like every experience you have, whether of God or like your dog or your feeling of being hungry, all of these experiences, if put in an MRI machine, like there would be a readout, you would see little parts of your brain light up, your brain would be produce, producing the experience. So uh, what would be far more shocking is if, you know, we put these people in an fMRI machine and there was nothing happening, then that would be the real miracle. <laughs> As if like the brain was somehow not involved in a conscious experience. Um, so, um, so yeah, no, of course the brain is involved in the production of these experiences. That doesn't mean though, I mean, the causal, the causal claim is tricky. Um, this is not a settled debate in neuroscience and philosophy of mind. Um, there are people on all sides of this battle, like do brains, does like a brain state cause the experience? Are they identical with each other? 
um, can um, some sort of like idealized uh, experience cause a brain state. So it's like there's there are there are a lot of debates about this. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's a short story is that, yeah, of course, the brain produces or at least mediates uh, these uh, experiences, but we should be careful with the causal language. So just as a sort of caution against somebody going out and having listened to this and then going on an LSD trip, what would you say to caution people against just going out, you know, hearing what you're saying and then saying, oh, what Sarah Lane Ritchie is saying is that we should all go out and do drugs? Yeah, so that, I would not say that. <laughs> uh, so Sarah Lane Ritchie would not say go do drugs. Um, the Spiritually Incorrect are... podcast would also uh, not say that. <laughs> Just as a disclaimer. I know. <laughs> um, so I don't advise people on illegal ways to go procuring things, or and I don't advise people on whether or not they should. Um, I do advise people on ways to uh, legally inquire into these experiences. So there are a lot of research studies that you can just start Googling around, and you can find a lot of research studies that are actively recruiting people, healthy participants, or people with certain disorders um, who would be great participants for a psychedelic uh, study. And the benefit of one of those is that you get all sorts of therapeutic uh, professional support to aid you on the, in the process. Um, there are also legal ways. So like psychedelic churches exist. I would be very careful about that kind of thing. Uh, there are psychedelic churches. There are shamans. In the U.S., um, religious uh, communities uh, can give, can use, basically, they can use psychedelics as, like, a religious, uh, part of their religious commitment. So now you have all these sort of, like, spiritual but not religious communities popping up all over the country where you can take psychedelics legally. But you got to be very careful. You really, really have to be careful. I would say, like, uh, I'm not saying you should go down that route. If you were to go down that route, I would build up a very long-term relationship with people you trust who have been in those very particular settings. Uh, find someone you trust. If you start talking around, you'll find somebody, probably one of your friends, probably one of your mentors has had experiences with this. Like there are ways of finding out more about this and ways of accessing it in legal contexts. Um, but I would just urge, urge extreme caution, use your mind, be wise about all of this and don't do anything rashly. Like these trips, if they're gonna be successful, really can tend to take like months of preparation. Um, and be honest with yourself, you know, if you think, you know, if you have any reason to think that you're psychologically uh, not super steady or have any sort of like history of destate, mental destabilization, don't do this, at least not unless you're being treated in a clinical setting by a practitioner. Um, there are states that are opening up legalization. So Oregon is decriminalized now, I think, for psilocybin. Um, and other states are kind of following suit with it, like so that practice, like clinicians can prescribe psychedelics. That's happening more and more. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And my hope is that there will become sort of constructive, constrained pathways for people to pursue that will involve like a lot of like as these things become more legal. I'm hoping there'll be a lot more regulation around the process and that there will be kind of a set process for people who have a mental illness. There'll be a set process for people who are just um, seeking to enhance the quality of their life. So if I can return to the question of the mystical tradition, how do these experiences relate to the religious traditions, uh, mystical experience, and are there any places where they differ? Yeah, so I think that it's, you know, it's not hard to start reading accounts of psychedelic experiences and think that they are coming from a mystic. Like there are many accounts of psychedelic experiences. If you didn't know the context, you would swear. It's like, oh, it's Teresa of Avila. Like you would say, it's like Julian of Norwich. Like you would swear it's one of these classic mystics. And then it's like, oh no, that's the Johns Hopkins study. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's you would, you would swear that, that they are um, kind of like a medieval mystical experience. Um, so this is where context matters. Uh, if you are, you know, if you were raised a, a Muslim and are still a Muslim, it's very unlikely that you're going to have a psychedelic experience in which you encounter the Virgin Mary or Christ. It's possible. Same way for like me as somebody who grew up as a Christian, unlikely for me to have a mystical experience and experience the Prophet Muhammad, right? And so context matters. So in a lot of ways, like if you come, you know, if you are kind of steeped within the Christian tradition, 
um, I think you can make a strong case if you are kind of like steeped in the Christian tradition, the same tradition as the mystics, um, and you are prayerfully considering a psychedelic experience and like literally praying about it and pursuing it thoughtfully and with wisdom and seeking counsel from people that you trust. I think that there's no qualitative difference between the sorts of experiences you have on psychedelics and the kind of like a, a tr traditional mystical experience that's induced by meditation, fasting, uh, deep prayer, silence, darkness, that kind of thing. Are there sort of Christians within a more traditional Christian sense of that word uh, in the contemporary context and or throughout history that can be sort of touchstones for people on this. I, I think of a funny example being a lot of people are uncomfortable with certain discussions like inclusivism. And then they hear that C.S. Lewis, uh, ha, you know, was open to those types of things. And then they're like, oh, well, maybe I should think about that more. Are there similar sorts of people that uh, the average, say, I don't want to say conservative or evangelical Christian might have heard of who actually are having these discussions, engaging these ex these areas that we should be paying attention to. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly some of these leaders are absolutely having these experiences, uh, but they're uh, on the whole, they're often not talking about it for very obvious reasons. It's a very risky uh, proposition. It's easy for me as an academic to talk about it because I have nothing at stake. Like I don't have, like, I'm not worried about like my presbytery firing me or something. So like, I don't, I, I just, I'm not beholden to any sort of like ecclesial authority. Um, but um, certainly there are theologians, philosophers, church leaders who are open to these things and um, seeking out these experiences themselves, but are not yet at a point where they're going to be talking about it in public. Um, that being said, there are uh, there are books that I have found helpful that are not about psychedelics at all, but I think kind of support the sort of thing that I'm talking about here. So any of the cognitive science of religion stuff I find to be really good. Actually, a book that's very helpful on this uh, is Mike Gray's uh, Philosophy of Religion at Notre Dame. Mike Gray's uh, uh, hidden the hiddenness problem or hiddenness of God. Sorry, the hiddenness of God. It's his Gifford lectures from St Andrews. Um, and he is, this is a fantastic book because he gets into the philosophy and theology of hiddenness. So like not experiencing God, why, why do some people not have access to God? And then he, instead of just sort of giving some theodicy for that, he says, well, actually contemporary science suggests there's actually quite a few things that we can do to sort of enhance our abilities to perceive God. And he's not talking about psychedelics at all, but like he, his the argument he builds in that book is the sort of argument that I have actually built elsewhere um, around spiritual technologies, and I would I would use I think it would um, it could it, you know the sort of argument that I would make for psychedelics. So there are certainly theological resources. So anything that any books or any thinkers who are demonstrating an appreciation of our bodies and the natural and like the empirical world, the material world, as those things being vital to our understanding of spiritual formation, those people are going to be useful. Um, also, anybody who uh, takes a hands-on approach to um, to belief or experience of God, that's going to be those that's going to be helpful as well. Um, and then again, there are certain, there are a variety of models. So actually like North Eastern Orthodox uh, theology is like a, it's like a, uh, well, there's debate about what kind of uh, model of God they have, but it's like, I would say it's at least panentheism. <laughs> and so there, and then there's, of course, there's panpsychism, which is not a theistic uh, worldview, but it is congruent with theism, I think. And there's, um, you know, uh, pneumatologies that are useful, like anyone that is talking about the spirit's active involvement in all of nature, someone like Amos Young, I think is useful. So there are ways of like situating the psychedelics conversation in different existing worldview debates that can be helpful. Thanks again for listening to the Spiritually Incorrect podcast. This was only part of our interview with Dr. Sarah Lane Ritchie. Our Patreon subscribers get the full content, including a discussion on marijuana and the possible psychedelic effects that it has, as well as a discussion on the possible spiritual warfare aspects of psychedelic drugs. All that and so much more at spirituallyincorrectpodcast.com. Go check it out today.
sound effects from zatsplat.com. Special thanks to Jordan Birch, whose song Starry Night provides the intro and outro for this podcast. You can hear more of his music on YouTube or Spotify.